we start talking about experiment 11 and then GC, which is, which is experiment 10. Okay, experiment 8. Most of you ended last week with the distillation of your ether, okay? But you didn't get the fractional distillation done, so the second distillation that you've got to do. You need to know the BPs, the boiling points, of your alcohol, okay? We have made all heptanols and octanols. So if you followed the instructions, you made either a heptanol or an octanol, okay? The heptanols have an atmospheric boiling point. So you need to know your atmospheric boiling point, not under vacuum. The heptanols, it's in the mid-150s is your boiling point range, okay? The octanols are in the mid-170s. Okay? So keep this in mind when you go to do the distillation because you need to know what the boiling point range is of your alcohol so you collect the alcohol over the right temperature range, okay? Um, if you have any questions before you start the distillation, make sure you talk to your lab prof to make sure you understand exactly what boiling point range you're looking for, all right? Um, now to be specific, you made either a three or four heptanol or an octanol, okay? So our um, heptanols, or sorry, our, our three whatevers are something like this, okay? Where we either have R is equal to just proton if it's heptanol, or another CH group, um, methyl group if it's an octanol. And then here's our four heptanols or octanols. Um, just be careful with, with each of these that you're drawing the correct thing for what you made in 8, so then you're drawing the correct thing for <coughs> predicting what you're going to make in 11. After you do this distillation, technically you've got your material to go on to experiment 11. But you need three pieces of information, okay? So you need to collect the yield for your alcohol. You need to collect the... Um, <coughs> You need to prepare a GC sample for your um, alcohol, this is for experiment 8, and you need to collect an IR spectrum. These two need to happen right after you're done with the, with the distillation, okay? So before you go on to experiment 11, collect your yield, collect your GC, or prepare your GC sample, right? The IR you don't have to do right after you do the distillation. Just make sure you set aside a little <coughs> bit to collect the IR spectrum, okay? And then if you have time at the end of the lab period, then you can go and collect the IR spectrum. So what do I mean by a little bit? You know for IR, you need one drop to take the IR. So if you have a couple drops in a vial, you've got plenty set aside as long as you cap that vial for you to collect the IR spectrum, okay? So just set aside a little bit in a vial and then go on with experiment 11. <coughs> You've got two distillations to do this week if you didn't do this first fractional distillation. So you wanna keep moving and then worrying about, worry about coming back here at the end. Otherwise with this one, you could always collect the IR spectrum in open lab, okay? So this, the IR doesn't have to happen this week, but these two do, okay? Um, now, you're probably going to end up with two product fractions from this fractional distillation, where you, the first one being you start about 15, 20 degrees from the boi what the boiling point range is supposed to be and start collecting alcohol, and then you collect the alcohol right at the boiling point range. Um, for the yield, you could kind of take that in two pieces. You could have your overall yield of those, which is probably not completely pure alcohol, and then you could have the yield of what was your really pure alcohol, what was really boiling right at that boiling point range. For the IR and the GC, I would use your purest sample for the GC and, and the IR, so you know exactly where what your um, purity is and how, how good that alcohol is, okay? For going on to experiment 11, you're gonna use both of those fractions. 
So you'll use the one from 15 to 20 degrees up to the boiling point, and then you'll use the one right at the boiling point range. Both of those can go into experiment 11, okay? So that's why for yield, it's a good idea to have your really clean yield, but also know how much both of those fractions weigh, because that's what you're going to be taking into the next experiment, okay? Um, now experiment 11, We're going to do an elimination reaction. This one involves an intermediate. So what type of elimination is this? You guys have covered them right now in lecture eliminations. No? Yes. So the elimination mechanisms? <coughs> no? Not yet? Okay. Uh, you'd already gotten there. Okay, so this one's an E1, all right? Um, the dehydrohalogenation from a couple weeks ago was an E2. This one's an E1. We've got an intermediate in the middle, all right? So if we look at, we're going to look at 2 heptanol, okay? As an example. We react that in the presence of acid. Then we're going to get this intermediate. So we form a carbocation here, okay? So we've got our OH group here. What happens is we've got our lone pairs on our OH group. They can attack the proton of the acid. So then we've got water. What do we know about water? What is water really good at doing? Would you form it? Does it want to hang out there? No, what does it want to do? leave, okay? So it wants to leave, all right? <coughs> We've got all these protons attached, and I'll show you here in a minute while I'm showing our attached protons, okay? Okay, so we lose water. In the process, when we lose water, then we get our carbocation intermediate, all right? And so we had lost water from this carbon, so there's our carbocation. But now we've got the conjugate base from, from our acid, okay? And it can come in and take any of these protons. So it can come in and take from this side, or it can come in and take from this side. When it does, then it donates it's electrons, okay? <coughs> and so what we can form then is either one heptene or we'll form trans and cis two heptene. products are definitely possible products, okay? Um, something else that we have to take into consideration, okay, is <coughs> what will happen with that carbocation. So what do we know about carbocations? What do, do they like primary, secondary, tertiary? Where do they like to hang out? Most substituted. The most substituted, right? So they definitely like a secondary versus a primary position. <coughs> they definitely like a tertiary versus a secondary position. Okay. They can also kind of move around at an equal energy level, too. So that it is possible that we could have, you know, we've got a secondary position here and a secondary position there. It is possible that that carbocation can move back and forth just between those secondary positions. But it'll, most likely it's going to move around when it's going from something less stable to something more stable. Okay. And so related to that, is Zaitsev's rule, okay? And so what happens with that is the more um, substituted alkenes are the major product.
So like in this case, between what, one heptene and two heptene, two heptene is going to be more favored over one heptene. Okay. Now what do you know about alkenes and cis and trans and what happens with those? What's going to be favored more, cis or trans alkene? Trans, trans alkenes will be favored more. Okay. So that's not Zaitsev's rule, but that's a different a, additional thing we have to consider is that cis and trans alkenes here <coughs> trans is more favored. Now what that's not saying is if you can form a trans alkene that you will only form trans alkene. Unless you do some really special things you're going to still have some cis alkene in there. It's just you will most likely end up with more trans than you will cis. Okay, so that's what that is saying. All right. Now, we for this reaction, we are using sulfuric acid. Okay. We are not using HCl. So our conjugate base is if we. Break this bond here is HSO4 minus. What do you know about that base? Is it a great base? Especially as far as being a nucleophile? No, right? So it's a, it'll work for our purposes, but as far as <coughs> acting as a nucleophile, it's not going to be great. Versus if we look at HCl, what do we know about that guy? That's a really good nucleophile, right? So with this reaction, you can also get substitution instead of elimination, OK? So if you use something really nucleophilic, you're going to end up with substitution products, maybe more so than you get elimination products, depending on, on how well it works, right? Well, if we use sulfuric acid, we don't have that problem, OK? So that's why we're using sulfuric acid versus HCl. Um, we're using the 9 molar sulfuric acid that we used last week. So again, be careful with it, OK? Wear gloves when handling it. If any gets spilled, let us know. We'll clean it up. We don't want anyone to get burned with it. It's just same same thing as last week. It's half dilute concentrated sulfuric acid, so it's still a really powerful acid. Um, and you're going to use more of it. You're going to use 50 mils of it this week for, for your reaction, so be really careful with it. Um, at the end of the reaction, you're going to heat this reaction. At the end of the reaction, you're going to have really hot things with hot acid in it. So you've got to be really careful with that at the end, too. And all of your glassware is going to be coated with this acid. So you want to be really careful handling it um, and getting everything taken apart because it'll all have acid in it. Okay? So just, just keep that in mind. So what's going to happen this week? is we are going to use what's called a steam distillation, right? So you're going to start out with your alkene plus your sulfuric acid is going to be in your round bottom flask, in your 100 mil round bottom flask, all right? No, sorry, not alkene, alcohol. We'll make the alkene. Um, so you're going to heat these guys up, and you're going to get the mixture to distill. Now, you've got a combination of things in there. So you're not going to, when you're collecting things and looking at the boiling point range, the boiling point range isn't going to be exactly where the alkene boiling point range should be, or it's not going to be exactly where the sulfuric acid boiling point range is. It's going to be kind of in between them or below them. So it's about 110 degrees or so, give or take, is where you're going to see your boiling point range. So you're going to heat these up until they are boiling. You're setting up your simple distillation so that you are going to collect in your 25 milliliter graduated cylinder. <coughs> and what happens is this mixture of acid and water and alkene will distill over 
into whatever you're collecting. We're collecting it in our graduate cylinder, okay? Um, and then as that mixture cools down, your alkene will separate out from the aqueous acid, all right? So it'll come over as a mixture, but your alkene and the acid will separate out. You will get your alkene over before you distill everything over. So you're not going to distill all the liquid over. What you are looking for is that you've um, pushed over all of your alkene product. So alkene versus um, sulfuric acid and water, what's going to be on top, what's going to be on the bottom? Yep, alkene will be on top, acid will be on the bottom, right? Because alkene is just all carbon and hydrogen. It's going to be less dense than the aqueous acid, all right? What you are watching for is that alkene layer, so part of why you're doing this in a graduate cylinder, because you can measure. Once that alkene layer stops growing, you stop the distillation, okay? What you may have to do is go a little bit beyond that, because sometimes the alkene distills over so well you don't get very much acid and water, and you can't really see the layers well to see the separation, okay? But once you see a separation in the layers and all the alkene has distilled <coughs> over, you're done with the distillation, okay? Um, so keep an eye on that alkene layer and try and measure how many, what is its volume. Once its volume stops growing and you have enough of your bottom layer that you can then do a separation of the two layers, you're done with, with the distillation, okay? Um, so you stop the distillation, when alkene is done collecting. Okay. <coughs> now we've got this, we've got a graduate cylinder with our product in it. We've got this whole distillation apparatus coated in acid, okay? So we've got to be really careful with everything. It's very tempting to take the base off your graduate cylinder to make everything work in your setup, but I highly recommend don't do that because it's really easy to pull your graduate cylinder off, not put the base on, set it in your hood, and then all of a sudden it tips over and you lose all your alkene all over the base of your hood, okay? And that's not one week's worth of work, but that's two weeks worth of work, okay? So be really careful with the graduated cylinder. Make sure you leave the base on it. Once you're done with the distillation, put it in a very safe place. I'd even put like the graduated cylinder in another beaker so it can't tip over, okay? But be really careful with that graduated cylinder, okay? We've many times had to do chem wipe extractions off the base of the hood because someone has spilled their alkene layer, okay? So you guys don't want to have to do that. Um, and you will only have a little bit. You're going to have probably about four to six milliliters of alkene, okay? So you're not going to have a whole lot to work with. So if it spills, it's not going to be easy for it to spill. You recover, and you still have some left in your graduate cylinder. So first thing, once everything stops dripping, turn it off, let everything stop dripping. Put that graduate cylinder, very safe spot. Don't lose your alkene layer, okay? Let everything else cool down really well, and then as you take things apart, rinse them with water to get all that acid out of all the pieces of your distillation, okay? So just make sure that you carefully rinse things with water, get, get all that acid all cleaned out. When you get down to your distillation pot, that still has a lot of acid in it, all right? it does not go in the organic waste because all that acid in the organic waste would be very reactive. We can't do that, all right? So if we've done the distillation correctly, we've really gotten rid of pretty much all our organic material, okay? There's nothing else in there but a lot of aqueous. So then what you are going to do is you're gonna have to take one of your largest beakers, fill it about two thirds full with water. So you want, you know, four to 600 mils of water, okay? You're going to very carefully put the contents of that <coughs> round bottom flask into the beaker of water, all right? Then that beaker of water is going to go down the sink in your hood with a lot of water, flushed with a lot of water, okay? But it does not go in the organic waste. Don't put that, what's left in your distillation pot, which will probably be 
you know, you start out, it'll be kind of not colored or maybe slightly colored. In the end, it'll be either probably a dark brown or black color. It's going to be very highly colored, okay? So dilute in the beaker of water, then put it down the sink with lots of water. Do not put it in the organic waste, okay? We also don't put anything aqueous in the organic waste, so keep that in mind. And while we're talking about organic waste, um, hopefully this week won't pertain as much as last week, is magnesium sulfate organic or inorganic? Inorganic, right? Don't put it in the organic waste, okay? Because it's inorganic, it's not organic, right? So don't put that. So a lot of organic waste last week had was getting, the solvent was getting dried by magnesium sulfate. But you don't put magnesium sulfate in the organic waste, okay? Um, when you are all set with this, okay, then you're gonna separate your two layers, all right? Very carefully, so make sure your stop dock is closed on the separatory funnel. Separate those two layers very carefully. Then you are going to wash um, that organic layer, the alkene layer, with sodium bicarbonate. Um, be careful, it may want to really bubble. So when you, after you separate the two layers, you're gonna add sodium bicarbonate to it. Remember, what does wash mean? You're gonna, you know, get your organic layer, you're gonna add your bicarb, then what? Shake them then three times. Separate to the two layers. Drain off the aqueous layer, right? So make sure you drain off the aqueous layer, okay? <coughs> um, then you're going to dry with magnesium sulfate. Now the key here, so last week we had our alcohol was still in ether when we were adding the magnesium sulfate. This week you have your neat alkene, all right? That all it is is alkene. It doesn't have any solvent with it. Actually, probably a mixture of alkenes, okay? Um, you don't want to use too much magnesium sulfate because you're not going to need a lot. So you want to put your alkene, last week we were, you were probably in your 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask with your ether alcohol layer to do, add the magnesium sulfate. This week you want to use your small Erlenmeyer flask and you're not going to need much magnesium sulfate, okay? So just add what you need. You, all you need is a little, is clumping with a little free floating. Okay, um, and then you'll, just like last week, once you have that, swirl it, cover it with saran wrap, let it set 10 minutes. The reason that you have experiment nine in your lab manual, this is the only reason, is for the scheme that is in experiment nine, okay? So figure 9.3 is what you need. You are going to make a filtering pipette, so we'll show you in lab this week how to do this, okay? This is to filter off the magnesium sulfate, all right? So you're going to pipette your alkene layer that has magnesium sulfate through the, this pipette, okay, so pipette into here, through here. This has a chem wipe in it, and it's going to filter it. It's, it'll act like, instead of your fluted filter paper, this is for the gravity filtration. It'll catch the magnesium sulfate, and the alkene will go through. I recommend the vial that you filter into, you know the mass of, so then you can easily get the mass of your alkenes, you'll know the product mass, okay? And you're just going to filter your um, alkene mixture through here, and then we should have pure alkene mixture on the other side with no solids or water. If there's any solids or water, if there's water, we have to dry it again. If there's any solids, we have to filter it again, okay? The GC, we'll talk about it here in a little bit, it can't have any water on it or um, any solids on it because it'll ruin the column, okay? So make sure there's no solids in here and no, no water, all right? Then you've got your alkene, okay? With the alkene, you want to collect just same thing as you did with your alcohol, okay? 
<laughs> you're going to have yield. You're going to make a GC sample, and then you'll collect the IR spectrum. Okay. And again, these two pieces have to happen this week. Worst case, if you run out of time, you can collect the IR spectrum in open lab. Okay. Now, both the alkene and the alcohol, are they going to be solids or liquids? Liquids, right? So you will collect the IR spectrum just like you did with experiment six. So experiment seven, with the solid, you had to put the anvil down for your product. For experiment six, you had liquid samples that, for the most part, you just left the anvil up, okay? So you'll collect the background with the anvil up, collect the sample spectrum with the anvil up, all right? So just keep that in mind, and then just make sure you clean the IRs off really well in between samples so people don't end up with cross-contamination of each other's um, samples, okay? Eventually, you're going to need to get literature spectra to compare your IRs to. I talked a little bit about this last week. So for an alcohol, you want something that's structurally similar. So if you've got a, you know, you made three octanol, you can't find three octanol, but you could find like four octanol, that would be great. Something that's a <coughs> similar secondary, positionally similar secondary alcohol. Um, the alkenes, you're most likely making a mixture. You want to try and find one of the alkenes in your mixture that you predict is supposed to be in the mixture to compare the um, IR. Okay, so you won't you won't look up all of your alkenes or have to compare it to all possible products, but use one of your major products for comparison for IR. Okay, so you need liter literature spectra for both for the alcohol and the alkene. Um, then once you have your yield and GC um, of both your alcohol and or collect the yield and prepare the GC sample for the, both the alcohol and the alkene, you're good to go. Um, the IR, if you have time, you can collect that for your alkene and collect it for um, the alcohol. But if you don't have time, then use open lab for that. Great. Questions on any of that before I go on to GC? Okay. So experiment 10 discusses gas chromatography, all right? And so that's what we're going to spend the rest of the lab, lab period looking at. <coughs> so we've got gas, gas chromatography. Now we've looked at a couple different chromatography, well, we're looking at our second chromatography here, okay? What does, what do all chromatographies have? What are the two pieces they always have? Stationary phase. Stationary phase and a mobile phase, <coughs> right? okay? And chromatography, again, we are looking at a separation in a little bit here. I'll talk about, for our case, how that separation will work. Okay, so our mobile phase, what do you think it is if it's gas chromatography? Yeah. It's the carrier gas, okay? The stationary phase is this liquid polymer film on the column. So even though it's a liquid, it doesn't go anywhere. <coughs> That's why it's the stationary phase, because it stays put. All right? So, this is kind of not the greatest picture, but your laminating looks a little bit better. Um, and we'll show you the GC this, this week, okay? But basically, the schematic's a little bit easier to see. So, GC's here, but we'll show it to you this week. You have an injector, that's where the sample gets injected. So, we have an auto sampler that will inject your sample. Then the gas that's running through here is going to carry your um, sample all the way through the injector to the column. Then it'll go through the column and separate. And this is a very tiny column, okay? Um, come out the detector, then it'll detect what are the pieces that came off and goes through the data system and gives, gives your data, okay? We use what's called a capillary GC, so it's a really tiny column. Okay. Um, 
that's heated. Um, we'll show you an actual column this week, what it looks like. It's very, really tiny. So in this column, like our, our column right now is 29 meters. So it's all coiled around in here. So the gas is gonna travel through 29 meters um, to come out the detector, all right? So what is happening here? We've got, here's kind of a slices of the, the um, column to look at, okay? So you've got this outer covering of the column and then we've got this polymer liquid film on the inside and then the gas goes through it. So this is what it looks like if you cut, cut the capillary column and look down through it, okay? So everything's passing through that center. What happens is the injector heats it, okay, and vaporizes it. So we've got this gas that then goes through, starts entering the column. And we change the, um, <laughs> how hot the column is over time. That will help then separate out that mixture. And so as it goes through the column, it'll separate into components and then at the end be detected, okay? So if it's separating based on how it vaporizes, what is that separation going to be based on? Boiling. boiling point range, right? Okay, so the separation is ba based on boiling point range. So lower boiling point range, going to go through the column faster, a loop faster. Higher boiling point range will take more time and a loop later, all right? Because of how, how it is vaporized as it goes through the column. Okay, because we start as a gas here, and then we are starting at a lower temperature than we are out here, and that gas, then we've got that mixture, how it vaporizes, at what temperature will then separate out that mixture, okay? <coughs> so our injector, you, we'll show you the GC this week, you can't really see the injector because it's in inside, but basically, the sample is injected through the top, and then we've got carrier gas right away, ready to carry that sample down to the column, and this whole injector is then heated. In our case, we use a temperature of 220 degrees, so this whole thing is really hot. So you don't want to touch the top of it because it's, it's already heated, it's really hot, right? Vaporizes your sample down to your column, all right? Now, there's many different possibilities for columns depending on how you want the separation to work out. Um, you can have some that are more polar, some that are kind of intermediate, some that are nonpolar. The column that we use is relatively nonpolar. So, for the most part, the separation that you're going to see is going to be based on boiling point. If we use something that was more polar, then you'd have to consider boiling point range and what's the relative polarity of the different compounds, but ours is mostly nonpolar, so it's the boiling point range is what's what's going to separate um, the compounds, and that's going to determine how things elute is by boiling point range. So again, things that boil lower come off faster, things that boil higher come off slower, okay? Now what's really nice about the GC that we are using is the detector. It's very sensitive, okay? So here's our sample coming into our detector, it's coming from the column, okay? So it's been all separated out, it's coming in from the <coughs> column, we've got carrier gas pushing it through, and then we also have hydrogen pushing through. And the reason we have hydrogen there is we've got this flame here. And this detector is called an FID. It's a flame ionization detector. So just like the name says, we're going to make ions and they're going to be detected, okay? So the sample goes into that detector and what happens with the flame is it's basically charring that sample, but at the same point we're going through this polarizing electrode and so we are, we're forming ions that are coming off of this flame and they're being collected here, okay? And so those ions, depending on how much they, there are, will make 
current, right? Because we've got ions, okay? So we can detect how much current we have. If we have a really small amount, we have a really small current. If we have a large amount, we have a really large current. And it'll detect in order of the pieces coming off of the column, okay? So that's how the flying ionization detector works, and then that sample is then vented off, okay? So then the information from this is then sped over to the computer data processing, and it figures out what, what your data looks like, okay? So here's an example of data, all right? And I'll show you here in a minute. You actually get this in two pieces. You get your heat table, and you get um, what the chromatogram looks like, okay? But basically, we're, we're measuring over time how long it takes to go through the column. So starting here at zero when it was injected into the injector, going across, and the bigger the peak, the more sample there was, the smaller the peak, the less sample there was. It's calculating um, the area of the peak and basically figuring out the area under the curve to figure out the relative percentage of each of, each of these peaks, okay? So individually, you're going to end up with one page that is peak table, okay? And so you'll have, what is the retention time of the peaks? This, this is the start time and the end time. You don't need to worry about this so much as just the retention time, okay? Then it'll give you information like peak height, peak area. What is, what are the peaks relative to each other? So this is telling you what the biggest peak is versus smallest peak, that sort of information. What you want is the retention time and then the percentage of that total sample, how much it, of it is each component, okay? And then the other piece that you're going to get is the chromatic fam. So that is looking at then your individual peaks, okay? And on each of these, your sample ID, your initials and notebook page will be printed, printed on each of them. That's what I blocked out here is person's identifying information, okay? So each sample, your experiment eight and 11, you're going to get a peak table and a chromatogram. You're getting two pieces of data. Don't lose your data because you're going to need to analyze your data. In your lab manual, on page 1011, is this table, this example table. This is an example of how you want to report your data for the GC data, okay? And so you're going to give the standard retention times, which we will send you information about standard retention times. I'll talk about that here in a minute, okay? You're going to have standard retention times, you're going to have the retention times from the actual data, okay? You'll have the area, so our peak area, and you'll have the area percent. You'll report all that information, and then based on your standards, you will identify your peaks, okay? Now, what we don't have is every possible alkene, so you have to use the trends in the standards to figure out where relative cis and trans isomers fall, as well as what relative two, three, four um, alkene positional isomers fall, okay? So the, the heptenes, which came from our heptanols, we've got relative cis, trans, cis, trans isomers, okay? We don't have all of them, so you have to use that relationship to then predict what your other peaks correspond to. So for example, the um, cis and trans heptenes fall in the range of like about the 2.6s into the 2.8s. If you have something that you can't identify just based on the retention time, where there's a peak in there that falls in there, it probably is a heptene, and you have to figure out which one it is based on the information you have, okay? So if you've got trans three, trans comes before cis, and then trans three comes before trans two, if you've got all this information, you can then figure out where cis, cis two comes from. Okay, does everyone understand what I mean by using the trends in the standard retention time to standard retention times figure out the rest of your sample, okay? Um, you'll also have information about your alcohols. Another piece that you won't have is you potentially can make the ketone of your alcohol, okay? 
it has a slightly <coughs> lower boiling point than the alcohol. So what does that mean about retention time of the ketone? So your alcohol getting oxidized to the ketone, what does that tell you if it has a slightly lower boiling point? What is its retention time going to be relative to the alcohol? It'll be slightly less retention time, right? It'll come off just a little bit faster. So we don't have standards for this, but if you see your alcohol, you have a peak slightly before that, that's most likely the ketone. And so you need to identify that in your table, okay? So in the table, you, you have standards you can use to identify peaks, but you also need to use just the information you have itself to identify peaks. If you can't identify any peak, a certain peak, then you're going to leave it at market as unknown. But if it's, be really careful marking that. Make sure that it's not one of your alkenes you're not accounting for, or it's the ketone of your alcohol that you're not accounting for, okay? All right. Um, now, as far as the GC samples, okay, they have to be dry, and they have to be, there can't be any solids, okay? So the GC samples, need to be dry and no solid. Otherwise you'll ruin the column putting the sample through there, okay? So when you distill your alcohol, look at your really clean alcohol. Make sure you don't see any solids in there. Make sure you don't see any signs of water in there. Okay, so when you collect your alcohol, make sure what you're collecting in is very dry. Don't wash it right before you use it, okay? Make sure there's no signs of any water in there and no solids. Same with the alkene. After you filter it, make sure you don't see any signs of solid and there's no signs of water in it, okay? In your lab manual, it gives you instructions in experiment 10 for preparing your sample. If you have a really dry sample without any solid in it, you can use the following prep, but it has to be dry, no solid, okay? You can put one drop of the sample in your GC vial, okay? And then fill the solvent that we use for GC is pentane. You're going to fill pentane to the neck of the vial. And then you'll cap the vial and, and um, shake, mix, you know, mix your sample. Okay, so shake it to mix it. So um, the vials look like the GPC vials, okay? It's just the caps are slightly different, all right? So you're going to put one drop of your sample in the vial, add pentane to the neck, cap it. Don't cap it too tightly. The auto sampler doesn't like if there's a big dimple in the top of the cap, so just cap it just to where it's tight, all right? You're gonna label your vial, remember? And we'll fill out um, the sample sheet, just like we did with um, GPC, okay? Label your vial, remember, initials and notebook page, and that is it, okay? <laughs> So all I want are letters and a page after it, all right? So initials, notebook page. Make sure that's on the vial in Sharpie, and then also fill out the sample sheet. Be careful because we've got experiment eight, so there's a place to put experiment eight, and there's a place to put experiment 11 on the same sheet, and also in the same sample trick, all right? So experiment eight goes closest to your drawer number. Experiment 11 goes the next column over, all right? Make sure in your notebook, you also record what your sample ID is for experiment eight and what your sample ID is for experiment 11, because you're gonna get all this data back 
And you've got to figure out what goes with what, right? So make sure you record these sample IDs, okay? And then make sure you submit both experiment 8 and experiment 11 GC sample before you leave this week, all right? Because pretty much like this week, especially with the morning sections, as soon as all the experiment 8 samples have been collected, I'm going to start running the GC and get it going. The GC takes, um, like we've got to run every student in organic as an experiment 8 sample and an experiment 11 sample. I've also got 13 standards I've got to run, okay? And so once it starts tomorrow with experiment 8 samples, it will take until probably Saturday night for it to stop, all right? so. Um, make sure that you submit these samples, otherwise they're not going to end up going in the run um, with the rest of your class. All right? Questions? Okay. You are all